Hello and welcome to the senior oral, the senior thesis of Grant Orion Barrage. We are honored to have you here with us. My name is Mr. Priya. Grant has been my senior assistant this year in pre-calculus and has done a fantastic job. Um, joining me that you'll meet later are Mr. Blackburn and Mr. Miller. And uh, yeah, so this is our, our first day to do virtual orals. So thank you all for uh, who are tuning in for the first time or the second time or the third time. And uh, there are a few things that are unique about this, uh, as is the tradition. Uh, Grant will deliver his 15 minute speech or so. And uh, during that time, um, we would encourage you to participate as much as you're able on YouTube or on Facebook where you're watching uh, to offer up any comments of encouragement. Um, and we will allow Grant to be able to see those during his question and answer. We won't show them before then in case it derails him. And so uh, we'll ask one round of questions that the staff will. And then as you guys have a chance, the audience has a chance to ask questions. We'll go ahead and post two or three of those uh, for Grant to be able to answer live here. So uh, do uh, ask some questions that you've always wanted Grant to uh, be able to answer uh, on the hot seat because uh, he's heading there pretty soon. So, um, and just as you comment, I would say, uh, uh, just a shameless plug, if you're on YouTube, go ahead and click the like button so he knows that you're there. And uh, do the same on Facebook. Facebook allows you to uh, click like and love, et cetera, as many times as you want. And he can go back later and, and see uh, the audience participation. So um, let me open us in prayer and then I'll uh, hand things over to Grant. God, thank you so much for this good day, for um, all the accomplishments of Grant Barrage and uh, for the ways that uh, you have gifted him, the ways that he's led at the school um, and this message that you've given him that he has really lived out faithfully. Give us ears to hear what it is you have to say to us and uh, give Grant boldness as he speaks. In Christ's name, amen. The heat is on and every one of your moves is monitored and scrutinized intensely. The world that we live in today monitors each and every person through a magnifying glass and is quick to pounce on any wrong action that we may take. So why would we want to live a life for Christ? What is the benefit of being bold for Christ? Why is it hard for someone? Uh, why is it hard for someone to stand up for what they believe in? How do you make an impact for Christ in a world of compromise? All these questions have a common thread. They can make you feel uneasy, uncomfortable, anxious, or even embarrassed. As humans, we like to sit back and do whatever is comfortable or whatever is part of our routine. That is not always a bad thing, but it can lead us into a position where we could miss out on an opportunity to make a change in someone's life. Have you ever encountered that one person who was on fire and passionate for what they believed in? Or come into contact with someone who is completely unashamed and willing to be bold for their faith? There are very few men and women who possess this incredible fire and zeal for the Lord. In a world of compromise, it can be extremely difficult to be bold for Christ. I'm going to look at the benefits and struggles of being a bold Christian in the world of athletics, in the church, in business, and in the world of politics. First of all, what is boldness? A lot of the time when people think of boldness, they think of having to get up and stand in front of and speak in front of people or confront someone to their face. But there are several ways we can be bold. You don't always have to be speaking to be bold. Sometimes our actions can speak just as loud as our words. In Ephesians 6, this is what Jesus tells us about boldness. Praying at all times in the spirit, with prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that the words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth boldly, that I may proclaim the mystery of the gospel, which I am an ambassador in chains. We are called to declare the gospel boldly, as Christ would have done. If you look at the Oxford Dictionary, it defines boldness as a willingness to take risks or act innovatively, confidence or courage. If we want to be an example of boldness for Christ, we have to be willing to take risks, and at times, it could make us uncomfortable. We can be bold for Christ even if we've done some things that we aren't proud of in the past. Sometimes, those things we aren't proud of are the best way to share the testimony of the gospel. God calls all of us to be bold for him. 
and he knows that we will never be perfect. In Matthew 28, Jesus gives us the command to go out and be bold. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. For us to live out this call to be bold does not always require us to take actions that make us uncomfortable. Sometimes the easiest way to be bold is just to show love to those around us. Boldness does not always require you to be screaming in the face of a believer or non-believer. St. Francis of Assisi said, present the gospel at all times, but when necessary, use words. It requires us to be active and to show passion towards the gospel and compassion, not only to the believers in Christ, but to the non-believers as well. Boldness is being confident in your conviction in both actions and speech. So first off, I'm going to look at the world of college athletics. The, co the world of college athletics can be ruthless to Christians. In the college athletic world, it can be very difficult to be bold for Christ. There are many rules and regulations that restrict the coach or players from being an outspoken, uh, to be outspoken about their faith. For more information on this topic, I had the pleasure of in, uh, excuse me, interviewing a good family friend and Division II men's basketball coach for the University of Charleston, Dwayne Osborne. He's also the Mountain East Coach of the Year. I was very curious to know the good and bad aspects about being an outspoken Christian in the world of college athletics. Mr. Osborne said, it's not that it's hard. It's the fact that it's not always comfortable. The society around us tells us not only to do what is comfortable or what makes you feel good. That's not what Christ has called us to do. We find ourselves a lot of the time only settling for what is easy or what is comfortable. Mr. Osborne said that he does not struggle to share his faith or be bold about his faith, but, the, but he knows that there's a possibility for criticism. The best thing to prepare for our struggles is to be upfront and honest before anybody ever has the opportunity to, to uh, excuse me, to criticize you, to criticize you. The best thing to prepare, I know from my own personal experiences of playing basketball, that it is definitely not easy. Teammates can be difficult to be bold with because you don't want to be looked at as that guy, or you're so close of a friend with them that you don't want to be the one to tell them that they're wrong. Being bold for Christ in athletics might be more challenging than any other area of life. No one is interested or even cares about what your faith is grounded on. Therefore, it is difficult to share with those in this area of life. However, if each Christian athlete is bold enough to demonstrate Christ-like behavior and boldness to give glory to God, it will encourage other Christian athletes. There's strength in numbers. For Christian athletes that compete on a college level, sharing faith can be a struggle. So you may think that being bold for Christ in the church is easy, but it's not. I think that the church is one of the harder places for someone to be bold for Christ. I think most of the people in the church fall into the trap of assuming everyone is a Christian. As an insider in the church, we think that it's going to be easy to be bold for Christ. But a lot of the time, we find ourselves pushing someone away because we don't want to stand up for what we believe. Many times we forget that the church is a group of sinners too. We can still fall victim to the enemy's ploys. I was able to speak with the pastor of missions and evangelism at First Baptist Church Odessa, James McCrary. I asked him what the hardest part about being a bold Christian in the church was, and he told me, the hardest part about being bold for Christ is the fact that it is countercultural to what the world looks like. Even though we are in the church, the devil still attacks it and tries to tell you that it is not beneficial for you to be bold for Christ. So why do we shy away from talking about our Savior? I know it's uncomfortable for a lot of people, but it could be life or death for that one person you did not speak to. It's also seen on the mission field. A lot of the time as the church, we think that we have to travel far and wide to, for it to be considered a mission trip, but that's not the case. Our biggest mission field is right in our own backyard, right in our own church. The greatest way for us to show the love of Christ and be bold for him is just to be loving to those who do not know him. God loves all his creation, and he has called us to love, not judge one's life. While the church seems to be easy to be bold for Christ, it can be one of the most difficult. Another area where it's fairly difficult to be bold for Christ is the business world. The business world is a little bit different. It is not as personal as some of the others but I think it can be personal just the same. Potentially in the business world, you could have a lot of employees who look up to you. You could be a CEO 
or manager. And it is your job to show the love of Christ by being bold and leading by the example that Christ would have led. I had the pleasure of reading the book Faith in the Halls of Power by Dr. Michael Lindsay. And in this book, he interviews some leaders of the world who are faith-believing Christians and compiles their responses in his book. Lindsay states, in nearly every case, evangelical business leaders think of their work as making a difference in the world. He tells the story of Myron Ullman, the former CEO of JCPenney, and how he flipped the company around. Myron Ullman describes his take on business as, I look at it as 150,000 people that I could reach, maybe not in an evangelical way, but the way that we run the business and the culture that we create. If we show the love of Christ to those around us, then they could be more willing to show the love of Christ back. Even though he is not explicitly proclaiming the gospel, he's showing them love, just like Christ would have. The business world is an area where it can be difficult to be bold for Christ, but it's quite important. On the contrary, we can look at how easy it is to not be bold for Christ in the world of politics. Arrogance is what causes most politicians to be hated or rebuked by the very people they are trying to please. Religion and politics is often put off to the side because the criticism that is coming is not wanted. Trying to find the right balance of respectfulness and passion is the hardest part. Most politicians end up coming across as a jerk or simply arrogant. Religion and politics is often never shared because according to the Constitution, we have a separation of church and state. In addition, religion is squelched in politics. In American history, we had the pleasure of bringing about Martin Luther King Jr. He started the movement for the desegregation of America. Martin Luther did this in a bold way. He was not rude or bashful towards the racial hostility. He did not try to start fights or be arrogant to the opposition. Rather, he showed love to all the people around him. Martin Luther believed what the Bible said about the equality of humans, that we are all created equal no matter our race or language. Martin Luther was successful because he was not arrogant. He was strictly doing what God had called him to do. If we want to be bold for Christ in the world today, we should follow the example of Martin Luther King Jr. and the example of Jesus and do what God has called us to do. We have to die to ourselves and put those who we are trying to witness to first. Arrogance causes many of the men and women of faith to come across as haughty or stuck up, especially in politics. This is not how we want Christians to be viewed. As believers, we, want, we need to be our best example of Christ so that the world sees who Christ really is and, and sees the love of God. So what is the benefit of being bold for Christ? We see that there are a lot of benefits to being bold for Christ. If we look at it from the aspect of the church, you're giving the gift of salvation to someone and could save their life. If you look at it from the world of athletics, it could be thought of just the same. Being bold for Christ is not always getting up in someone's face and telling them that their life decisions are wrong. It's about showing the love and compassion that Jesus shared with us. Christ did make people feel uncomfortable with what he said, but he did it in a loving way. He gracefully told them that they were not walking down the right path. If we choose to be bold for Christ, then we are fulfilling his great commission. The worst thing that we can do is sit back and be comfortable with mediocrity. Being bold is not comfortable. No one wants to be put in a situation that makes them feel uncomfortable. Most of the time, Christians like to settle for being comfortable in the world, and we like to be comfortable thinking that we are set apart from the world when we really are. If we choose to live our lives boldly for Christ, then we can make a huge change in the lives of others because of the gospel. In Ephesians 6, I'll reiterate Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. People are with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. that The words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth boldly that I may proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. We are called to pray for the words to proclaim his gospel boldly. So if you look at these areas of life, it can be easy to be bold for Christ in the world of compromise. If we choose to be bold for Christ in our lives, it will not only encourage others to be bold, but we will also see a difference for Christ in the lives of others.
All right. Well done, sir. Thank you. Now the real fun begins where we get to put you through the ringer. All right. I'm ready. I, I have all these questions that I want to ask you, but then I keep seeing the questions that other people are asking and I, I want to steal theirs over there. So I'm going to have to show some self-control here. So, um, my favorite comment that I've seen before, I guess I can't tell you until you've seen it. Never mind. Okay. So uh, tell us just briefly um, what your plans are for the fall, um, assuming that we're all still here in the fall. Well, um, I am going to be attending Midland College um, in hopes of transferring later to Texas Tech. So go Shaps. Right. Uh, so, um, and where do you see yourself, you know, five, 10 years down the road? I'm hoping that uh, I'll be able to continue my mowing slash landscaping business and that I will be able to actually have a professional full scale landscaping business within five to 10 years. So if you got yourself, uh, isn't bad boy a, a brand of mower? Yes, sir. You get like bad boy, barrage, boldness, something <laughs> uh, beast in there somewhere. Uh, uh, well, I, I can call my lawnmower the beast, but yeah. our company, as of now is called brothers lawn care so okay. i could you know make it i could make it big baller brand or bbb and have something you know big beast barrage or big brother whatever something like that yeah there you go brothers care of my lawn maybe i don't know that's that's kind of classical so uh maybe i should be your maybe i should be your marketing representative that's what it's sounding like to me all right uh okay so tell me how uh you picked this topic amongst all the things you could have chosen although as though it's a mystery to us um, well, at camp this summer, our theme was basically boldness, and that, that verse that I gave Ephesians 6 um, was our theme verse. And so just at camp this summer, I really caught on to that, and I really hadn't had a topic. You know, most people have their topic picked out by sophomore year, and they think that that's, that's what they're ready for. Uh, but I really hadn't had a topic picked, and so that at camp this summer, that really uh, – hit me and I was like, that's what I want to do for my oral. That's what I'm ready to do. So it's good. Well, sometimes you need to be hit upside the head with it, but it doesn't surprise me since this is kind of the life that you live, you know, um, to borrow Mr. Schumann's comment from before at the senior orals, we said, don't forget to mute your mic. Although I bet if Grant mutes his mic, we'll still be able to hear him because you just kind of, you, you live yeah. this way. So, so this is, this is a natural thing for you to do. Um, okay. So, you know, a couple of the, the uh, examples you picked, you had some strong examples, Martin Luther King Jr., of course, Jesus, uh, uh, the go-to, but it, he, he works pretty nicely in this. And I was thinking today about uh, the life of Christ and kind of your examples of boldness. And I realized that there is a lot more overlap than I kind of first uh, uh noticed when I heard your topic. And so you have to kind of go with me a little bit down this road. But um, so uh, you've got kind of your sports metaphor. You used your teammates, you know, the Knights. Uh, you've got uh, church as another group that you're looking at. You've got the business world and you've got the political realm. OK, so rewinding to the time of Christ, who do you think kind of matches most closely to Jesus's teammates um, that, that he lived his life with? I definitely say it's the, the disciples. You know, those were those were his homies. Those were his teammates that he did everything with. You know, those are the ones groomed and led to be, uh, you know, led to be followers of him. So, you know, of the word, yeah, so. that's good. I don't know if uh, I haven't read the Gospels through that lens, but like, what are some things that Jesus did to the disciples that might be instructive for us to know how to interact with our own teammates, whether we're doing sports or not? I think the, the biggest point you can look at is the, just the leadership that came through um, because really I've never had the role on the team of being a real scorer or best player. So I've just been the one who has been out there for the emotional leadership support. And that's definitely what Christ did with his disciples, you know, led them um, spiritually, emotionally, and groomed them uh, to be you know, followers of him and to be the sharers of the word. Okay. Yeah, that's good. He also told them a lot of stories and uh, they were kind of stupid a lot. And so he had to like point out a lot of the errors in their ways a lot. What do you think that would look like as a good teammate where you have to like, I don't know, call people out in that kind of way? Uh, for me, it was most of the time just trying to help the teammates control emotion. 
because yes, I cared if we won or lost. It wasn't the most important thing for me to have a win or have a loss. Like I was upset after we lost our state semi game, but you know, you, you gotta be the one to be the, the person for somebody to look at, which I'm not saying I'm all that, but just to be the one that's, that's there for them to have an example of the emotional, physical, you know, leader there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll kind of skip around. Um, uh, there's, uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about this, but okay. So the business world, you know, where you kind of enter this arena where people aren't really like you, you know, unlike the church, um, or your, your own sports team, who do you think the people were that Jesus interacted with the most who had the least in common with him? Uh, definitely. Uh, well, he always, act, uh, interacted with the you know, tax collectors or sinners. Um, okay. You know, the ones who did not know what he was talking about um, and who were living a life of sin, who were, you know, scamming people out of money or, you know, prostitutes or whatever it may be. But yeah, OK, I think that's right. And so uh, what kinds of things do you see in the scriptures about how Jesus interacted with those people that may be instructive for us about what boldness looks like with people who are different from us? Well, like I said in, in my uh, speech, like. Jesus showed love to everyone, and he also did let them know that they were walking down the wrong path, but he did it in a loving, graceful way. Um, like, that's, that's how he was. That's how he was. That's how he ministered to others, was telling them that their decisions were wrong. Yeah, I, yeah, that's good. And, you know, I think one interesting thing about the Gospels is there almost isn't anything that it says about what he says when he's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. You know, it's mostly like people on his team like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he's hanging out with them. But somehow the message that he presented to those people who weren't like him made them want to be around him a lot. Right. I mean, they sought out his company and he sought out their company. Um, all right. One more. How about uh I guess, who do you think the kind of the, you talked about politics, who are the key politicians of that day um, in, in Jesus's day? Oh, you had a, oh, well, it was, the Pharaoh, you had, um, oh, I'm trying to think the king of whenever he was born. Was it Herod? Herod, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, Pharaoh was a little him. Him. Yeah, you had Herod. Um, and then, you know, you had, probably had some others along the way, but those are the two that I, yeah. like, stick out in that time. So what was his interaction with the Romans like? Do you do you remember much from the Gospels? I mean, he was trying to save them. He was trying to save everybody, but yeah. uh, he definitely, he was crucified by them. So yeah. I kind of, as I recall, like he really didn't have much contact with them, right? And so do yeah. you think there's something that should be said about our involvement uh, in politics as Christians, just because it seems like Jesus wasn't really interested in that? Do you think we should be distant like jesus was distant well i think honestly our country would probably be led better if you know we had a, a bigger presence in politics mm, okay because you know we haven't since you know way back we'll say a blinken you haven't really had a president or you know senator who's really been a christian or well that hasn't really been outspoken about it okay uh, we definitely had them, just they haven't, you know, uh, given their opinion on the subject. Yeah, got it. Okay, very good. Thanks. Mr. Blackburn, you're up. Well, Grant, it's uh, a pleasure to uh, get to hear about you talking about something that so clearly is uh, something you live out, that you've been bold. I saw that in RT groups and saw that in the classroom. So it really comes across true. Hey, something we have in common is uh, being sports fans. And uh, with Lint, we were encouraged to give up something. And I thought about it at the time when uh, Lint got started that maybe I should give up sports. And I, no, I can't do that. And then all of a sudden, I had to be forced to give up sports. So I'm wondering how that uh, fast from sports is going for you. Oh, it's not going very well. Well, it's kind of, it's, it's going better. I expected because I'm a huge football fan and football season is also not happening right now. So that's been kind of a plus, but I also, we also missed out on March madness and the start of baseball season. And I also missed out on my base, my senior year of baseball. So it's kind of been, you know, it's kind of gone down. Yep. 
didn't realize we could live without that. I imagine we're learning some lessons about it. Well, thinking about uh, Joshua, and he uh, came, uh, was the leader of Israel after Moses, probably one of the greatest leaders ever. And Moses has died, and it's time for Joshua to take the uh, nation of Israel to go and take the promised land, cross the Jordan River, Jericho, and all that. And God says to uh, Joshua in Joshua 9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. And one of the definitions you gave for uh, being bold was courageous. Uh, the Lord went on and said, uh, Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So how does that scripture uh, inform your uh, thesis? Well, I think he's, he's just telling Joshua that he has all the tools ready to be bold, to be the leader that God has called him to be. Um, because Joshua was scared. And honestly, I would probably be scared to be put in the same position um, because he's now leading uh, a whole country, you know, uh, lots of people. So it, it, but God's just telling him, don't be frightened. I've given you all the tools to be bold for me to lead these people in the right direction. And, and what do you think is that key? What's that key uh, tool that was given to, to Joshua so they could be strong and courageous? I'm, I mean, he basically already had everything laid out for him. Moses had done the, the hard work, but he was also you know, a student under Moses, so he was ready to um, he was ready to lead the people. And so that verse ends with, uh, "For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go." What? Why did it end with that? Because I think he was. I think Joshua was kind of trying to think of how he would do it himself without having God to back him up or without having God to be there with him. But he, but God was affirming him right there saying, the Lord, your God will be with you wherever you go, no matter your trials, no matter what happens. Yeah, I think that's good. It, it struck me that uh, it's almost like he's contrasting, uh, be strong and courageous. And he says, do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. So like contrasting strong and terrified and courageous and discouraged and you know discouraged you know i had never thought about being discouraged is not having courage not having boldness so uh, what role does discouragement play in keeping people from being bold i think encouragement uh, a lot of the time it just it makes you doubt yourself um, and causes you to not be confident in your words or speech um, so it, you know, you won't be as confident talking to somebody about the gospel if that's um, what you're, what is presented to you. Good. Last Saturday afternoon, my wife and I watched online the graduation ceremony at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, and the main speaker was Vice President uh, Mike Pence, and he shared a C.S. Lewis quote with those 967 graduates who are getting ready to become uh, military leaders. And so C.S. Lewis wrote, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. Let me read that again. Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. Why do you think that Mike Pence would have used that quote uh, with uh, some Air Force uh, graduates? Well, I think, um, I mean, if you're going to go into battle in the Air Force, uh, you have to have courage. Um, it's kind of like a, another synonym for courage is bravery. So you have to be brave and be able to do it without hesitation. And that's kind of like how it is whenever we're going to share the gospel. We have to, if, we're, if God's telling us to share with this non-believer, we have to be bold and do it without hesitation. Because a lot of the time, that's when we miss our opportunity. Because opportunity is set right there for us, and we miss it because we didn't act on it fast enough. So it says it's the form of every virtue at the testing point. So like a, a virtue like kindness or love. What would virtue or love look like if you didn't have courage? I don't think it would be like 
personal or anything like that because courage is coming from your heart and well so is love but i don't think that if you don't have courage then you can't fully express the feeling of love or kindness in the light that it needs to be expressed okay that's good i'll let mr miller go to the next Grant, good job. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I wanted to ask you a few questions about basketball since uh, that's my arena that I, I know about and, I, and I've had you around me. So at the beginning of the season, can you tell me how you've made yourself comfortable before the season starts? I just I, – I don't go in with high expectations – because I, I like to be, I like to exceed my expectations. So I would go in with, you know, last year we made it to the state game, and I went in this year. I was thinking we lost a whole lot of people. We're not going to be as good. I was thinking first round of playoffs. That that'll satisfy me. We made it to first round of playoffs. I'll be good. Um, and so you know, I just didn't go in with super high expectations so that I my expectations weren't met. Okay, can you like? What I'm talking about is you individually before the season starts. Are you pretty comfortable on the couch eating your uh, snack foods and, and all those things? For sure. <laughs> okay. So then when you come to practice, what causes you to get out of your comfort zone? I just think motivation from teammates and from the people that will be watching games, if, you know, at the practice at the start of the season, it really kind of sucks because we're all out of shape and not ready to play basketball. So we're getting, you know, having to get back in the swing of things. But I think it's the motivation from the teammates around me. They're also putting in the same hard work and getting out of their comfort zone just like I am. So it also pushes me to do the same. Do you think uh, Big Rob has anything to do with getting you out of your comfort zone? Um, maybe some. Yeah, he, uh, he does uh, – have a way of doing that with people. Could you say that he shows you current reality? So then you yeah, can. Honestly, um, he, he does. At the start of the season, he like gathered the, the varsity guys together. And I don't know if many people have heard this, but he, he told us, he's like, y'all going to suck. Y'all will not be a good basketball team unless you put in all the hard work that it is going to require. And we did it. And honestly, it kind of, from that point, it just kind of boosted us through the rest of the season because we had to, we had to bust our butt to get good because we had lost so much from our team last. So I want to ask you then after that, so now you got current reality, you got somebody that's pushing you. What, uh, what helps you gain vision in basketball for what you need to do? What just practically speaking on the court, what, how did you gain vision or expertise or, how to fit within a system, all those things. What what helps you see that vision? Well, practice for sure, but um, without like besides practice, just chemistry with your teammates and coach. Because um, without that, honestly, it wouldn't be you know wouldn't be a team sport. It would just be a one man game. So just the chemistry with teammates, but you know just showing love to your teammates around you uh, will also help out with that. Okay. So now you've, you've gotten out of your comfort zone, you've gained vision, and now you want to just keep fighting. You're in the fight, you're in the battle. What keeps you uh, coming to those practices? What keeps you fighting? What keeps you working hard uh, to ultimately be as bold as you can be, whether it's physically or mentally or emotionally, what's your motivation? Well, my, my motivation is just I have people if if we're already in the in the thick of it, in the heat of the season, I have put so much time and effort with the teammates that I am with. And if I choose to just stop putting in effort, it ruins the rest of the season for the team because it lets down all the teammates that I've been been along with for the ride, putting in all the hard work with them. And it just it would just ruin the rest of the season if I just decided to quit right then. And then at the end of the season, you're going to get a reward, some type of reward. Can you tell people because you did all that, 
what are some of the rewards that you gained at the end of your basketball career or the end of your season? Honestly, the rewards that come, I don't really care about the awards that I got from basketball. The awards that come are more of the relationships that were built um, not only through basketball, but through, you know, a lot of time is through spiritually. The get the gift that we get going to MCA is the fact that we can that we pray together as a team that you know every once in a while you'd come in with a short devotion for us before a game. And you know, just the fact that we can come together spiritually, not just physically as a team, that I think that just that's the greatest reward I could have after a season. And so I am want you to correlate that to your Christian walk. In other words, you're uncomfortable. So, I mean, you're comfortable maybe in Odessa, Texas. So you decide I'm going to go to Deer Creek. And then all of a sudden you get put out of your comfort zone and you go, man, I, I want to be bold. Uh, can you kind of correlate that with your Christianity, what you went through with basketball from a practical level? and bring it over to how God deals with us or how you've grown in your faith uh, through, through being comfortable, then gaining a vision, and then what you fight for, and then what are your rewards? What, are your, what, what do you think you're gonna gain out of it? And some of those are the same that it was in basketball, but can you correlate that a little bit with your MCA uh, growth? Well, I think, um... You know, our, the, the vision that I, that, like, I have is to just try to minister to how, however many I can um, and just, be, just have the boldness to be able to stand up in front of them and proclaim the gospel. Um, but that's, like, that's kind of what MCA has, has taught me. I was super excited to do uh, apologetics this year because I really wanted to um, – be able to study the rest of the, you know, other religions and such that, so that I can know how to combat the, uh, the devil in that situation. If I ever come, if it ever comes to that point, but then, you know, you look at, it's also just about ministering to, to others at MCA. My goal has just been to minister to whoever I can. I like to do it to the younger kids. I just like meeting new people. So I try to meet most, almost everybody at the school. I'm sure most of them could tell you they know my name and that I've come and spoken to them at least once or twice. Uh, so it's just about like ministering to them. But then the reward that comes out of it, the reward is greater than what than anything I, I can have here on earth. The reward is greater than the friendships that I will create, the you know, the relationships that have come out of it. The reward is spiritual, you know, the reward is heaven. And I know that, that, that that's coming and that we will that I have the opportunity to see Jesus one day and that me ministering to a student could that that could change their life and they could have the opportunity to see Jesus one day. Thanks, Grant. Thank you. All right. Yeah, water break. I really wish Hagen was your water boy and would just come up and like squirt the bottle, you know. So I should just have Jake right here. He was our water boy for basketball. I need him. Yeah kind of boldly splash it in your face kind of thing. So I think that would be great. So now it's time to hear from the audience and see what kinds of questions they've dialed up. All right, Bennett Casey. Oh, she's in our pre-cal class. There's some bonus points for her. Is it possible for boldness to turn into arrogance? And when does that happen? How does that transformation happen? Good question, Bennett. I think it's, um, well, I do think that it, it can, um, but I think it goes the other way. I think arrogant, I think, well, I, I do think your boldness can turn into arrogance because a lot of the time when you are that person who is the one acting boldly, you kind of think you're all that and you know, and you know what you're doing. If you're actually seeing an impact happen, you think, oh yeah, I've got this. I can do whatever I want now. And then, you know, it gets in your head and then you turn in, you turn in, it turns into arrogance. So how do you keep that from happening? Um, and uh, yeah, uh, how how do you recognize that in yourself? And then how do you uh, how do you keep it from happening? What do you do at that point? A lot of the time, I think it stems from pride because um, okay. we have to. We think if I struggle with this a lot with with pride, thinking that you have to 
always be the one that's on top or be the one that's always the example or be the one that's always the leader. And so, you know, I struggle with that sometimes. Um, so I think just a way to help you with that is to also put, like have the people in your life that are, you know, different from you that aren't, or that aren't going to just build you up to make you think that you're always doing what you need to do or doing what is right. So I hear you saying you need to have friends in your life who can bring you down a peg. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, who's, who's a friend like that? Who's been able to, um, like help keep you in check, um, during, uh, uh d during your time at the school? Uh, honestly it was David. Um, okay. he used to butt heads all the time and I acted like, cause he, he would act like he was, you know, Mr. Know-it-all sometimes and I would act the same way <laughs> and butt heads and then it would cause, you know, cause us to, you know, cut each other down and then we'd figure out, well, maybe I didn't know what I was talking about. Maybe yeah. it was right. So it just seems like often those kinds of people that you tend to butt heads with, uh, it's easy to just kind of walk away and be like, you don't even know, me. like, I don't need you in my life. So like, what actually allowed you and David to get over that to the point where you were ready to like hear from one another and like sharpen one another, so to speak. I definitely think it was just uh, maturity, um, you know, because that was probably more like freshman year um, when, when it was like that, but just as we've grown and had more maturity, we realized that that's stupid. Why am I arguing about the favorite flavor of ice cream or whatever it might've been, you know? So I think it's just maturity that comes that, you know, that comes with life. Yeah, it's good. And I think part of that maturing process is having those kinds of things pointed out to you. So, um, so I think that's good that you've had people in your life who've, uh, who have been willing to do that for you. All right, let's see what else your audience has dialed up. Who's next? Ooh, Emma Westfall. She's also in the pre-cal class. She's also in the, hold on a second. Is this all stacked? Uh, are they, are they bribing the moderator to get bonus points? That would be messed up. Uh, what do you think the balance between letting your actions speak and sharing truth through words. So actions versus words. And then uh, in what ways can actions validate or invalidate your words when you're sharing truth? So let's just, why don't you tackle the first one? Or you can go in whatever order you want. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the first one. Um, I think the, the, the right balance, it's usually, it usually ends up that your actions are more, I think for someone who is the quiet leader, um, who is not the one who's always going to be, speaking or talking to you, which sadly, I don't have the problem with that one. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but you know, I think that like your words can all, like your actions can all can speak truth and the way you lead and carry yourself and, and what you do, but your words are also, um, you know, big time sharing your truth with that. It also so, seems, you know, one of the things you said earlier was it was about being uncomfortable. And so, or you kind of probably using the things that you're good at, but being willing to do the things that you're not. So probably what that means is for somebody like you, you probably have to kind of go out of your way to lead with your actions. And, you know, for somebody like Bennett, who raised that question from earlier, that she might have to go out of her way to say something. That's good. Okay. So the second part of Emma's question, uh, in what ways can your actions validate or invalidate your words when you're sharing truth? Well, if you're, if you're talking the talk, but you're walking a different walk than what you're talking, like that's, you know, that can invalidate your words. Um, if your words are sharing truth and, and sharing the gospel, but you are living out your life uh, in a way that is not resent, uh, like it exemplifies what you're speaking, then that can invalidate your words. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was one group of people that Jesus interacted with a lot that it seemed like he, he criticized them for that to where their actions and their words didn't really line up with one another or their insides didn't line up with their actions. Uh, do you remember who that was that he was the biggest critic of? Was it? it tax collectors? Uh, it, no, it was, uh, it was, it was some, uh, believers. It was people on the inside. I'm sorry. Was it the Gentiles? It was the Pharisees. And so oh, which I think probably is the people who are the most like us, right? That we kind of know the right things to do. We know how to kind of go through the motions, but but it is hard to get our actions or at least our insides to match up with the 
to what the message we're trying to communicate. So that's good. All right, good. What else we got, listening audience? All right, Marissa Kerver. Uh, what can you do to stay bold for Christ? Are there things that you think are essential to keep the fire burning? So how do you keep this going in your life as you get past the ripe old age of 18? Well, I mean, I will be introduced, like being thrown into a new area of life. Yeah. With and that's going to open up a whole lot of, uh, you know, a whole lot new uh, avenues to go down. Um, so for like the stable, like that's going to be what's, you know, I'll be coming into contact with new people and I definitely will be coming in contact with non-believers. Um, so being or like trying to um, share the faith or, you know, be bold uh, for Christ in that area and be able to witness to those non-believers that I will be coming into contact with next year, the year after that, you know, however, because you always become coming into contact with non-believers um, and people who are not Christians. So I think that's how you can keep your fire burning is just constantly ministering to those who you know are not believers. What about uh, when you get to be old like me or like super old like Mr. Miller or like mega old like Mr. Blackburn? Um, and I don't know, you just like see the same people all the time and you're just like, it's just same old, same old or like a mom. You know, there's moms listening in with just kids at home. It's just like, man, I see the same three people every day just making sandwiches, um, cleaning up messes, doing laundry. I mean, like what's boldness look like for those kinds of people? How do they keep the fire burning? Um, I mean, it's, I think it's just the example that they lead for the people that they do encounter. If you're encountering the same people like a mom, just building up your children to leave behind the same legacy that you think you're leaving behind, to, to be as bold as you are or you were, and to, you know, be the example to, of character, of, you know, spiritual character, whatever it may be for your children. That's good. Yeah, there's a book that my wife's reading right now that I've always wanted to. It's by Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message. It's called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And I often think that that's a lot of what boldness is, is speaking up when you need to, but just being faithful every day. Um, and th that's a lot harder to execute. So, all right. So we got uh, time for one more question from the audience before we kind of kick back to the panel. Uh, we got anything else? All right. Amy Cravey. Do you find it hard on a daily basis to be bold for Christ? Uh, and if so, I think she's assuming that it is hard for you. Um, how do you improve and uh, try harder to be bolder? Um, I think, well, whenever I was at school and being able to actually interact with people, I don't think it was as hard for me uh, as it is now because I definitely don't have the the same avenues to go down right now since, you know, we're in our, quarantine, coronavirus times, and it's, you know, it's a lot harder to be able to minister and be bold for Christ in the lives of others or in the lives of the younger students right now, because we don't get to have that interaction that I get to have, that I got to have with them every day just a couple months ago. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I have one last quick question, but who's uh, an underclassman at MCA that you admire for their their soft-spoken boldness or their verbose boldness. So, so somebody that you've seen live this out at MCA. So how, how young are you talking? Like just anybody younger than I am? Anyone younger than you. Um, I kind of think, I, I want to say Drew Littleton. Okay. Um, just in the way that he ministers to the younger students and just the way that he carries himself and shows that, yeah, he is a Christian. He's, he knows what he's talking about. He is a child of God. It's good. It's good stuff. All right. Passing the mic. Go ahead, Mr. Blackburn. I just want to ask two more questions and they're both related to things that I've seen you do so well, Grant. Uh, one was uh, last year you were the junior RT leader in the RT group that I was in. So there was a senior that was the leader and you were the assistant leader. Uh, I'm just wondering, how do you lead, how do you be bold when you're not the lead person? When you're, you know, maybe it's a pastor versus uh, somebody that's in the church or it's a coach and an assistant coach. 
um, it's a student with, uh, you know, the tutors in the room. How are you able to be bold and yet you're not in charge? I think it's just trying to, trying to uh, exemplify the same characteristics that the leader in, in your group or, or tutor or whatever it is, 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 you know, is doing and just try to follow in that, in that lead so that you can, you know, be the example and minister to the same, it's the same kids like in our RT group. Last year it was Aaron Giffen and he did a great job being the, being the leader of that group. And, you know, it was just a good time for me to sit back and learn from him to know what, what I was going to be needing to do this year in the RT group. So, yeah, you did that so well. And, um, you know, it kind of just points out that you don't have to be uh, the loudest person to, to be the leader, to be bold. Um, and also it just requires a lot of humility. Uh, some earlier question kind of brought that out that uh, you need to be humble. You know, Jesus said in Matthew five, that blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And, and meekness is that humility. So you can be bold and, and, and uh, also uh, humble at the same time. You've just been a really good example of that. And my final question is something else that I saw you do so well, is we would uh, try to start class with uh, prayer. And you were a very frequent volunteer about that. And, and yet uh, I've just seen lots of classes where a lot of people hesitate to uh, lead public prayer. Uh, talk to them. What's, the, um, what, what's it take to be that one who's bold enough to say, yeah, I'll, I'll pray in front of a group out loud. I just think, first of all, uh, it, I think it stems from just not being confident in the words that you're going to say. If you mess up and say some, something, your prayer is still going to mean the same thing. You know, you are still going to, you're still praying to God. If you're one of those who prays super fast and talks really fast, then pray like that. You know, it, you know, you can still pray and have a and have a meaningful prayer and, and talk to God, no matter how you how you speak to Him. You know, you don't have to have a perfected prayer to be able to pray in front of people. That's great. Thanks, Grant. And I just wanted to comment real quick. Did uh, Mr. Blackburn go on the record to say that uh, Grant you're a great example of meekness? I just wanted to uh, make sure that I heard that correctly. So, or soft spokenness. Uh. Uh. He was breaking up there a little bit. I wasn't, I didn't think that's what he said. I, uh, well, I was thinking about what AJ said, you know, about the mom that stays home and, and uh, is just the consistency day in and day out. And over the years I've thought, man, who do I really need to pray for the most in the Midland Odessa area? And it was pretty much Aaron Barrage when I would think about you and Hagen and Aaron. And I'm like, man, she's done a tremendous job with you guys as well as your dad. But uh, I, uh, I had to chuckle when AJ said that. The, uh, I want to just brag on you just a little bit, Grant, and uh, just to wrap up here. And I think it's interesting that uh, Pat brought up um, um, actually my favorite book of the Bible. Uh, and I've drawn a blank. Joshua. Uh, Joshua. Yeah. I, all I could think of was Joseph in my head, Joshua. And, uh, you know, Joshua and Caleb were the two spies that went in and only, and they're the only two that came out and said, yeah, we can go in and take this land. And, and so this past year when we were playing Lake country and it was the fourth quarter and everybody on the bench was basically slumped over, including coach Beatty and I, and we'd given up. I mean, we could not figure out a way to do anything. And you were bold. And you just started yelling for everybody out there on the floor and encouraging everybody in the loud way that only, only you can do it. That, that God has given that voice. Uh, and God has given a, um, an idea that when you decide you're going to do something, you just you go for it. And that whatever people are doing around you, it's it's somewhat inconsequential because you've determined what you want to go and what you want to be about. And, uh, you know, we could have still lost that game, but we ended up coming back and winning. And the only reason we came back and won that game wasn't because of basketball skill or wasn't because of this or that. It was because you didn't give up. 
and you 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 yelled from the bench and spurred us on and and that's a powerful thing and i've seen that in your life grant through your lawn business uh through filming at permian high school through establishing a good work ethic and what i want to i just want to commend you on on just uh, growing up and um becoming super consistent and a man of integrity because what you do what you do on the basketball court what you do when you're interacting with the people that you mow yards for what you do when you're interacting with the film crew at permian and then what you do at church and what you do in the classroom it's all the same and you have a consistent life and so i just want to encourage you in that area and i i don't think you're going to have any trouble being bold for christ I think Christ will continue to use you, uh, and and I think He'll continue to humble you when you need it, uh, because He knows what you need. Uh, but uh, thanks for being bold. Thanks for sharing your life uh, with us, and I appreciate it greatly. Thank you. Well, Grant, uh, you know I'm watching the clock, and I think we're really out of time for you to ask any hard questions for us. So if you have really easy ones, then we might have time to answer them. All right, all right. Otherwise. Oh, you do? Okay, great. Bring yeah. it in. We're ready for those. So, so uh, I don't think most people know your story of how you got to like MCA, Mr. Priya, and the, the cool story of what it is, which I, you used to work at my favorite restaurant. Uh, could you tell us how you got the MCA? Oh, man. Well, uh, you said an easy, quick question, but I guess I'll just try to start uh, from the most relevant spot. So I was born at a young age, uh, back in the early 80s, and uh uh, uh, went to high school in Arkansas, and actually, uh, you might not know this part of my story, but I came. I, I'm I'm a uh, I'm on my second tour of duty with MCA. I worked at MCA right out of college when I knew Mr. Miller from Camp Travis, and I worked out here from age 22 to 28, and then followed God's call to the Chicken Hut uh, to serve the blessed Jesus Chicken, and loved my time there. Uh, moved back to Arkansas to be close to my folks, and. Um, uh, uh, had it in my mind what things were going to look like in my future, and God had different plans. and And He said, "Not about Chick Fil A becoming an owner, uh, not now. You know, you can wait." And I'm not very good at waiting. And so uh, I reached out to some old friends and told them, "Hey, here's what's going on." And and Ron actually, Mr. Miller said, "Well, hey, there's some positions opening up back at MCA. Do you want to come work? Move back to Midland?" I said, "No, I don't think so." Um, and so, but God slowly wore me down, and to the point where I was like, you know. I could choose roots now and I know people there and I know that that's a way that I can minister. And, and I, you know, I occasionally look over the fence, but I am very, very glad that I am here um, with these people that I love so much. This, the, you know, a lot of the same staff that I've grown old with and to watch people like you grow up. It's just really fun. It's fun to have history with people and, and to watch people grow and change and to see what the work that God does in people's life over time. So, so, and eat more chicken, still love it. And that's a good sign if you work at a restaurant and you can still eat there. Um, I, I ate there seven, uh, well, five times a week when I worked there and I, I'd, I'd still eat there five times a week if my metabolism didn't slow down or if I could afford it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Blackburn, um, I know you've coached basketball for some 30 years or something like that. Um, what's your greatest coaching moment and why, would, why is it your greatest coaching moment? No, I've been sharing that with... Uh, some of my classes when we've had the virtual class and they say, Hey, take us for a tour in your office. So someone might be listening, might remember there's, I've got a, a picture book uh, that shows a memory of uh, one of the basketball seasons and it had to do with a, a senior post player who uh, hardly got to play his senior year. Cause he had like six, eight, six, six in front of him. And he was six, two and slow and couldn't jump, but he was just a great, great kid. And uh, we had a game that was a blowout that we were up like 80 to 20 or something. So he got to play a whole bunch and we put him in there and say, okay, you're playing in the guard position. You get to play over there in the wing and we want you shooting threes. And so they captured a, uh, somebody caught the picture of him shooting a three and the bench is behind just, they're all excited, raising their arms up. And he actually missed that one, but he made one earlier. So it was a fun memory. Just uh, Ryan Kotcher was such a, uh, humble kid that worked as hard as he could and made the team better. Uh, it, it's just a joy to, to have a memory like that. All right. Um, Mr. Miller. So I know your uh, alma mater is App State. 
And, you know, uh, I remember you told me one thing at the beginning of the year. What was that one thing you told me about App State football? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I, I yes, you you know you know what you told me. You I, it was, uh, you referenced another team that uh, kind of went to the national championship. Um, you know, Clemson. You Clemson. You told, oh, oh, that hey, we uh, <laughs> that we played Clemson close hey, or what? Yeah, you you were talking about um, Clemson almost losing to North Carolina. Oh yeah, like, they did. App State, you know, App State, you know, they uh, and App State beat Carolina. They beat North Carolina. That means they're better in Clemson. That's right. That's right. I did say that. Um, but uh, why do you think they're better in Clemson? You know, they didn't go to the national championship. Um, well, because I let the emotions get the best of me, Grant. I let my emotions get the best of me quite often. Uh, yeah. I just had to make fun of you a little bit. That's all right. I'm glad you did. Well, Grant, proud of you. I can't really have much to add to all of this other than um, thank you for being so faithful during your time at the school. Um, you've been a workhorse um, in class, outside of class. A lot of people look up to you and, and you've lived, you've been walking the walk uh, with all these things that you've been talking about. So um, thank you for living such a faithful, consistent life. And uh, we know God has thing, big things in store for your future. So I'm going to ask Mr. Miller to close us in prayer and and we can be done. Father, thank you for uh, Grant Barrage. Thank you for his family. Thank you for uh, this opportunity that you've given him to reach out to a lot of people through this oral. I thank you that you have put in his heart to be bold and a desire to be bold. And I pray that you would continue teaching him how to do that. Uh, may you bless his life in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well done.